Welcome to the tenth and last class of the Mahavidyas. And thanks to everybody who is being so seriously trying to be here every time and uh, support me you know, in this teaching. It's been quite valuable also for myself, I feel, to go through these ten ladies again and discover their power and discover their mystery, which was nothing new, but in a way, again, it comes out more clear you know, than before. So that is always very nice. You know? And so the last of the Mahavidyas is called Kamla, and she is the power of light. So now you see Kamla, very light, you know, very light picture. And uh, those who know a little bit about Indian gods and goddesses, immediately you will recognize another goddess, which is called Lakshmi. And it is true that Kamla is Lakshmi, but in the sense that Parvati no, or Shakti, the um, beloved of, of Shiva, here takes on the role of Lakshmi. No, she is not Lakshmi literally because, well, Lakshmi is married to Vishnu and she is married to Shiva. No? But, uh, okay, let it be clear there, everything is one, so also all the um, goddesses are one, all the female energies are one, so some will prefer to call the one female energy Shakti and others will prefer to call it Lakshmi or Parvati or Kali or whatever, it doesn't matter. So, anyway, Kamla is Lakshmi, but she is also a little bit different, we will come to that. And uh, being then, let's say, uh, very much related to Lakshmi, she is related to Vishnu and to the preservation of the universe. So that is where as Yogis, which is then no, Parvati, we also there have a task you know, to help in the preservation of the universe, to do the yoga of life, you know, to really live in a yogic way and contribute to life. And in that way she is also very much a symbol of prosperity, of abundance. You can see in her hand the one on the bottom which shows the Varad Mudra of prosperity that she is also there throwing coins. So she is a symbol of wealth also, of giving and sharing. And she is also very much a symbol of purity. And that is where the symbol of the lotus also is so much related to the word Kamla. She is always shown on a lotus and um, she is that purity of the lotus no, who grows in the mud but remains unstained by it, which is precisely what we have to do as yogis when we enter into life and interact into life. That is to do that but remain lotuses, no, remain pure and unstained by whatever is then happening. No? And she is sometimes also called Kamla as being clad in water, being clothed in water. And that is what these four white elephants are doing. They are showering her with water not to keep that purity. That is again a symbol that relates to the purity. So she is pure, she is the light, she is in that way also the sattvic energy. No? Because you have to understand that the energies of Shiva and Kali and Tara and all those yogic energies, they are tamasic energies. You can say they are destructive energies in the sense that they destroy the ego. And so that is different with, um, with Lakshmi and with Kamla, where we are trying to radiate the light no, of Sattva and sharing it. And in sharing it, helping to preserve the universe and to, you know, bring harmony in the universe. And so that is the image of uh, Kamala, which we then also see in the uh, Yantra, 
where the artist spiritual to Vedi, he mostly used the lotus no? as symbols of Kamla because that is what the name really means. But I do feel that he really could bring out the beauty of that sattvic energy. No? Personally, I think this is one of his most adorable yantra paintings, which really radiates a very soft and kind and beautiful spiritual energy. So then maybe first talking a little more about Lakshmi or Kamala being representative of light. Um, this is also, for example, seen in the festival of Diwali, which is a very big festival in India, which is the festival of light and where people will decorate their houses with lots of candles and oil lamps and where these days also then lots of fireworks are being used to celebrate Lakshmi. In some areas of India they also will celebrate many other deities, that is how India works, you know, but originally or essentially Diwali is about the goddess Lakshmi. And she comes here very rightly as the tenth of the Mahavidyas because that light of sattva comes at the end, let's say, of a process of purifying and accumulating yogic energy. Now we can see her as a kind of sun. No? There's lots of yogic power accumulated inside. And then when, you know, that energy is there and it is, let's say, enough and it is pure, then it starts radiating around. You know? And so that is really what we are talking about here. So that comes after all the work, let's say, inside of us, which is the principal yogic work. And then we have the second half of the job, is to bring whatever we have found inside of us, outside of us, and share it with others. You know? That is the path of Vishnu. You know? The path of Shiva leads us inside, to the self, you can say, and then the path of Vishnu is to bring the self out in the world, in life, and radiate this light. And in the universe, always light is there. You know? Even on the planet Earth, always light is there. Sometimes in the night, maybe we feel, oh, where is the light? But actually, on the other side of the planet, anyhow, the light is there. You know? So, in the universe, light is always there. And... Uh, it is also the light that brings the abundance in the universe, no? because all life actually is supported by light, no? through photosynthesis, the plants. So all energy that we then have in life is in origin, like here on the planet, solar energy, no? from the light of the planet sun. So in that way, it is a very essential power in the universe, a very essential thing in the universe, and uh, also in that way, a very spiritual thing. And the purity of it you know, comes from the intensity of that yogic energy. You know? When that yogic energy is not so pure, it cannot bring forward such a bright white light, you know? uh, which, is, which is Kamla or which is Lakshmi. Um, then it will be may, maybe more reddish or more orange or something different. You know? uh, not every fire brings out a beautiful light. You know? So that is first anyhow what needs to be done. No? Uh, and, and all the Mahavidyas help us in doing that. You could say, for example, Tripur Bhairavi, uh, very much so, no? because of the purifying effect of the fire of those sadhanas that she represents, which focus the mind and deal with lots of impediments of mind. So, but actually all the, um, all the Mahavidyas are doing that and uh, to place Kamla here as one of them also means that it may not always be time for Kamla. <laughs> Meaning that, you know, it may not always be time for sharing your energy, for sharing your light. Maybe it is time for Dumavati, which is almost the opposite of Lakshmi or Kamla which is called also Alakshmi, you know, the contrary form of the word Lakshmi, because she is totally in the dark. 
No? And she needs to work there. She needs to do some clean up there, which we have discussed. So it is not always time to serve others and be there for others. This is an important message. No? We can feel that obligation maybe, but that is not how it really is. Sometimes you also need just time to recharge and to work inside. And so it is your choice to say, let there be light no? and start radiating that light of the divine around you. No? That light is no, your inner light and it becomes then also an outer light, like you create more light around you and other people also see better and feel better. That is the main thing. But it is always your choice and you have to be a little bit also careful uh, with that. No? We'll talk a bit more there. But you have to be a little bit careful, otherwise you will not be able to keep it pure. No? And so that purity is that other aspect of Kamla, the nature of the lotus. No? She is also called Kamalatmika, which literally means she who is like a lotus. And uh, so that purity, to be not stained by anything, while you are engaged in the world, while you are trying to do something, and probably will meet some opposition, meet some obstacles, meet some stupid people, <laughs> uh, keep that purity there. It's not so easy, but uh, very, very essential. And uh, as I said, all the other Mahavidyas there are preparing you for that and are also to be kept <laughs> by your side, I would say, even if you are in that mode of sharing your light. No? You need the detachment of Kali, for example, no? so that you can do your karma, your work, without any expectation, no? which is precisely the result of any attachment. Or you may need Tara, you need, need the power of sound. You may need some regular purification in Tripur Bhairavi and so on. So, um, this engagement with the world around you always must be in detached attachment. You are attached in the sense that you are engaged, you are giving it your everything, but you are detached from any result. No? so that you can have your hands in the mud and still feel very uh, pure. So purity there is something to be watched. Otherwise, whatever good you are trying to do is going to have a bitter taste. You know? And it's not going to be very effective. It's going to end in confusion. If you do not yourself keep uh, a little bit pure, and this can be seen in so many different ways, and then in that way it may also be the time to say that to take a daily shower, for example, is a very essential thing. You know? In India people are very much used to that because anyhow there it's more easy to get dirty somehow. But uh, it should be done everywhere, wherever you live, even if you feel you are not dirty, energy-wise you are dirty. So to clean your energy, if not your body, daily showering, even twice a day, a short shower, is very, very advisable no? to keep this purity in your, in your gross uh, energy. The power of water there is really not to be underestimated. No? And here is also a very clear link again no? to the light, because I said the light is the life, no? it is creating all the life. And water is also jiva, is also life. No? The life energy gets purified through water, no? and, and uh, it is a, an element, you can say, uh, that, is, that is so important no? to keep. It is the lunar element, it is the moon element, it is uh, yeah, very essential, so that you can remain pure, and your sharing is pure, which means that it should only be there when you are feeling good. No? If you are not feeling good, if your mood is not good, then don't try to light up others' moods. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work. No? So, uh, that is very important. And then we also come to this other aspect of wealth, prosperity, that is linked here to uh, Kamala and uh, to Lakshmi. 
Um, so if you go in a shop in India, you look around a little bit, then usually if they are Hindu people, you will see Lakshmi there. So that relationship between Lakshmi and then also Kamla and prosperity, money, is, is very direct also. No? And uh, I think that is also very beautiful no? that, that the gaining of wealth, let's say, and, and we're really talking here about material wealth, first of all, is so much linked to spreading the light and sharing, no? being generous. No? She's showering these coins. No? She's giving. So that is a very basic understanding of karma which is there. If you want to assure your wealth, if you want to assure your material stability, then you should be a sharing person. And if you are like that, then karmically, automatically, abundance will be yours. Lakshmi is very much worshipped by the merchant caste, the Vaishas. No? And uh, that is because merchants means like, you know, business people. And business people are always very busy. So they don't have time for much else except some karma yoga, except some charity, except some sharing of whatever wealth they have acquired so that their prosperity can remain. You know? That is the whole idea there uh, behind it. And uh, of course, when we start sharing our more material wealth, that is not unlimited. You know? Very clearly, that is not unlimited. There, we have to share what we can share. You know? We have to first of all feed ourselves and our kids and our, you know, close ones, and then maybe okay, some is there still uh, to share. And um, it is a a subject in which our society very often makes like strange thought patterns. I would say. Like, the whole idea about the 1%, which is at the moment quite dominant, especially in the United States, uh, the 1% of the population who has, I don't know, very high percentage of the wealth, you know, that people feel that these people should be sharing you know, that wealth. But you have to understand that sharing can only be if it happens voluntarily. It's been tried no? to make sharing an obligation. That's called communism. No? It doesn't work. It destroys something in society which is vital. No? It destroys people's desires. It destroys people's drive to go after their desires. So that is not possible. No? So, we can invite the 1% to more share. And of course, you know, in as far as countries are still ruled by governments, which is not so very much the case anymore, but okay, in so far, then the community can uh, impose certain taxes and, you know, can force uh, the wealthy to at least share something. Or at least avoid that they abuse other people and pay them very low fees or, you know, whatever, that they are misusing their position of power. So in that way, governments still have lots of work to do there. But it will never be a solution which forces people to share whatever they have. Because then it loses totally the value. Like even for a wealthy person... If he has millions in the bank, what's the value of giving $10 to somebody? Um, so, uh, always the individual and the community, these two factors have to be taken into account. You know? The we and the me. We cannot put 100% on, on the we, and we also should not put 100% on the me. If, you know, we are into politics, you know, and we need to decide about these things. 
there always has to be found some middle ground, which anyhow is a power game. You, know? you also just have to see that for what it is. You know? So that's not what, what I'm talking about here. You know? What I'm just saying is that you can share your wealth, but you know, first take care of yourself and those who, be, who depend on you. you know? And then, okay, see whatever you can do. Anyhow, when we talk about sharing, there is a lot of things that can be shared where there is no limit. Actually, everything else which is non-material can be shared in a rather unlimited way, in the sense, you know, you can share a cup of chai, <laughs> you can share uh, your food skills, your cooking skills uh, in serving people's food, you can share art, you can share music, you can share your self-confidence, you can share your courage, you can share love, you know? just inviting people, giving them space. You know? We talked about that with Bhuvaneshwari, how love is a matter of giving people space. You know? Sharing love, sharing knowledge and understanding is another one of those things. You know? My knowledge does not get less by teaching here. You know? On the contrary, actually, you know, I learned something also. So, in that way, lots of things can be shared. Our peace and our bliss, our light, it can be shared. You know? But some limit is there, anyhow, in terms of time, at least. You know? In terms of light, also maybe, you know? what I said before. If our positive energy is also not so stable, not so strong, then maybe also we have to be a bit careful in sharing it. But still we can share most of these things. And the only thing that they are limited in a way is time. No? Because all these sharing requires time and especially in our society, time is money. No? So, it's... In a way, and pardon my language, is a little bit like a fucked up economy. Huh? We are in a very strange situation anyhow, anyhow you know? economy-wise. I mean, man came up with all these machines, you no? Know? Like a century ago, we started doing that, or a bit more actually, maybe one and a half. Started inventing machines, and the big idea there was that these machines they would take away our work. You know? They would do the work and we could be enjoying ourselves tremendously while these machines doing the work. And now 100 or 150 years later, we can see, yeah, machines are doing a lot of the work. You know? From agriculture to manufacture, even to administration, computers, you know, <laughs> they're doing a lot of the work. But then how come we are all still so stressed about our work? I mean, a hundred years ago, women were usually not even working outside of the home. No? They were doing the household. So only one in the family was going to work. Now in most families, two are going to work and still it's not enough. <laughs> still it's not enough. So what is this? That is something I wanted to talk about today because that we have to understand properly. How is that possible? A hundred years ago, people were living quite fine. And, you know, working, okay, yes, quite hard to get the food and get whatever they needed. And now we have all these machines doing all the work. Just we have to manage those machines, let's say in our work, and maybe manage the people also <laughs> that have to manage these machines, like therapists and so on, no? uh, are doing. But why is it then that this promise is not fulfilled? I mean, part of it is that working with a machine is maybe more stressful than planting potatoes, no? But that's not the only problem. The problem is consumption. If you compare what we consume 
today to what people were consuming even in relatively well-to-do families 100 years ago, then that is where the big difference is. I remember a time when I was a child when an apple was something special. You know, your mother give you an apple, oh wow! Or when I would come home from school and get a cup of tea with one biscuit. Now when people take a carton of biscuits out of the closet, the main problem is, are they going to eat it all or not? <laughs> so that is the problem. The economy and okay, you know, they say it's needed to keep it turning, but that's another question. The economy is made in such a way that we are always pushed, um, how you say that, uh, seduced through advertising and through also the way, you know, society is organized, to always buy more and more and more and more and more. Now some of our biggest expenses are even not in things anymore. <laughs> they are into software. You know, programs, you know, updates, upgrades, antivirus protections, all these things. So that is the main thing. If we want to somehow be able to live in spiritual way in life, the way we deal in wealth, it has to change. And so it changes by being more sharing with others, and in that way also somehow assuring our own safety there, our security there. But it also very much comes in living more simple lives. In, yeah, questioning whatever money we spend. You know. and, and my teacher Harish Johari very much always repeated simple living, high thinking. Keep things simple. How many cups do you have? <laughs> when I left that older house, I had so many cups. Where do they all come from? I don't know, but I had so many. Now I have nine. So I'm just saying, everybody has there to do it the way they feel. And we are not all the same there. You know. But we should look differently at these things. If we really want to follow this path of Kamla, if we can be less in need, let's say, in virtual need of all these things, and need only the minimum, then so much more easy it is to share. If people come unexpectedly and you know you still have a nice bit of cake in the fridge, but you were thinking to eat it in the evening, anyhow, you know, it has to be finished and you know, you were even looking forward to it because you like it. But then, you know, if you are detached actually from it, then you can easily share it and you don't even think about it. You know that is the better choice. You know? So, in that way we all have to do what we are able to do, and in a way also meant to do. And then I like to come back to the idea of the apple and the mango tree. You know? Here also in this sharing, we are all going to be quite different. So if you are an apple tree, you, know, you used to try to make mangoes. You know? So share whatever you have. Every person in a way has something unique to offer. And that is, you know, where your talent is. And that is what you can share. And so that is what then brings you also this power of light, you know? this, this radiance and uh, where you feel that in your life you are fulfilled. Nowadays people 
when they find in themselves a particular talent, they immediately want to make money from it. <laughs> this is our way of thinking. But that is not so much going to bring you fulfillment. If that talent you can use it to share with others, then that feeling will come, that light will come, that radiance will, will come, and you will really play the Leela as it is meant to be. You, know? you will really play your role. You know? Playing a role in a theatre means together, right? It's not on your own. You know? That's called a monologue. Leela is not a monologue. Leela is something we do together. Love is the most essential ingredient of it. So sharing also. You know? And we cannot there be all same. You know? This whole idea actually in yoga of the ego having to disappear completely is actually such a ludicrous idea. Like we are all one. Yeah, yeah sure, we are all one. But the truth is unity in diversity. No? We are all one and we are all unique. And that is our unique role in, in the game. No? On <coughs> planet Earth, they would all be identical. Like identical twins. You'd give them a pill, an anti-ego pill, and they totally lose all individuality. They all become exactly the same having the same tastes, the same talents, the same qualities, the same stories, <laughs> everything same. They are walking on this planet, billions of copies of each other. What of a life would that be? Doesn't make any sense? No, what makes sense is that everybody is different. That makes it interesting. And that also makes us all like, let's say, complementary to each other. Like in a couple, uh, you know, two people can also be complementary to each other. Not same. Also in a couple, we don't have to be seen. So also here, let's say, in our sharing, we can call it Karma Yoga, okay, that is still a little bit of a discussion maybe, but whatever, in what we do, we can all be different, fulfilling our own role, and uh, fulfilling there also whatever comes no, in our energy, and in that way, we also have to remember that the chakras are also always shown as lotuses. And what that actually means is that the essence of each chakra is as pure as the lotus. And if we can fully open the chakra, if we can fully manifest that chakra, then it will be like a radiating lotus and we will be able to share it. So that is something which is even more coming than uh, if you think about it, that we are all different, yes, but also in different layers we are different. In different chakras we are different. So we have plenty of possibility to share. And, uh, you know, one moment more this, one other moment more that. That is there in the chakras actually that it lies, no? where we can really help others with their own insecurities, which in a way are all related to to uh, the chakras. No? So, yeah, it's a simple story. I could go on a long time about Karma Yoga here, but I have a class on Karma Yoga on uh, YouTube already, so I don't think that really makes a lot of sense, because there uh, we're talking about something even a little more high than just a bit of sharing. It's really about dedicating your life to the universe or to some purpose, some cause, and so there also there are good ideas and, and bad ideas <laughs> which I talk about on YouTube and so in that way I think that's already covered. And uh, you can say Kamala is a, uh, a karma yogi. That is, that is very much true, so it does make sense. Um, but I would say that the word karma yogi is something very special. You know? To live a life for others, and not having any personal agenda except your bare, let's say, minimum, you know, that is a different path and should not be taken lightly. You know? If you still have lots of desires inside, 
first you have to work with that. Yeah? So anyhow, we are not all yet ready to become true karma yogis, even though maybe one day a week or something we can spend there. You know? But it should always be properly balanced. In a way, a real karma yogi is also a real bhakta because he will love everybody so that his karma yoga remains pure. Because if in karma yoga we are helping others, then maybe they are not always <coughs> behaving so nicely, these people. You know? Maybe they are greedy or whatever it is. And so to remain pure, we have to be full bhakta, you know? full lovers, unconditional lovers. This is not so easy again. You know? And we also have to be janis, to always see the truth of everything, to see the impermanence of the forms, to you know not get fooled by any of these appearances and disappearances that are natural in the universe, and to stay always with the truth and with the unity in diversity, which is, you know, jhana. So, um, in that way, it's, it's a long story or a short story, actually. The real karma yogis, as the real bhaktas, as the real jhanas, they are simple people, I think. They're not very intellectual. They're just following their heart, you know, and from there they, they can easily do what others cannot so easily do. You know? But that is also because they have arrived to that place. No? And that may take some time, so no hurry, anyhow. So, uh, yes, with Kamala we are finalizing this uh, series of mysteries. Huh? The big mystery here is how to be prosperous. And the answer is share. Whatever you have, share. And then you don't have to worry, at least always something will come back to you. No? And other people will also take care of you because you have been taking care of them. That's the easiest way to solve the first chakra problem, no? which is related to wealth and material existence and material security. You know? So that is the main thing. So um, I still promised that at the end of this series I would make an overview of all the Mahavidyas, like a table, where you see more like the connection between them or the differences between them in different ways. But I have not yet done that, I'm sorry to say. So it will come in one of the following satsangs, I'll certainly um, bring it. So this ends the story of the Mahavidyas for me at the moment, except if there's any questions. The idea here of this series of classes was not to teach you how to do any kind of tantric practice related to these ten Mahavidyas. The idea was to make you understand what they are about, to make you understand these mysteries up to the point, okay, where we rationally can follow, and to understand also the basic practices that are related to it, which are, for example, with Kam Kamla, the sharing, you know, and, and with uh, others, the purifying, or, you know, whatever it is. You know? So, because these are very general principles, you can say these are what constitutes tantric jhana, you know? the knowledge, the body of knowledge about uh, the energy, you know? the non-duality in a way that is there also on the level of the energy. But so, to work with each uh, of these Mahavidyas, specifically in Tantric way, to get some of that power, to get some help to develop that power inside of you, that is not something that can be taught on YouTube or here in an online class. That is something that must be closely guided. And so, if you're interested in any of this, then I can see if I can help you. And with that I mean that uh, if you ask it about Kali or Tara, yes, there I can help you because I have done myself. In some others, like say Chinamasta, I have not done. So then I also cannot help you there. <laughs> because that is how it, it works. No? One should already have a connection with these energies 
through practice before like teaching anybody else no, about it because only then you can do a proper tantric thing no so some of you actually if i look around quite many of you are already doing some kind of rituals that i was passing on many related also for example to kali one new one coming also on tara um, so in that way yes i can a little bit try to guide you and not just guide you in the practice but also and that is the main thing actually guide you in then whatever you are facing because you have to understand the tantric way is not so much an easy way if you start doing a kali sadhana let's say yeah <laughs> it's not going to make your life very easy huh kali is not such a teacher no she is going to bring forward many things and yeah she will help you to overcome your fear which is a primary reason to do some kali sadhana no uh, and in that way will be very helpful in in life but if you move on with that and you start more and more working with kali which for me for example is my main uh, ishta dev no form of the divine uh then she brings you also yeah obstacles so that you can grow no and and uh, she will then help you also in that growth that is the main thing of course <laughs> if she would only create the problem <laughs> that would be not be very nice so you will get help and through me also no i'll be there to help but sometimes a little bit it can be difficult some misunderstandings can be there and uh, so that is why this is not so lightly done No? so the tantric way is a very different way there and that is not what i wanted to teach here no? it's just not possible anyhow it always has to be individualized also because here we are talking about sadhana here we are talking about doing i don't know how many malas of a particular mantra for 3 months for 9 months for 2 years something like that that's what we are talking about here if we want to be seriously involved with this so then uh, yeah some energy will come no? some energy will start affecting you and and then better to have little bit guidance also no? yeah. but so individually i'm open to helping anybody for those mahavidyas where i myself have some connection no? they are all one that is also true but in tantric way they are also very different to have a certain level of purity is a requirement yes if we are doing a tantric work we are trying to attract a certain energy a certain entity which will help us now whether that will happen or not first of all depends on your purity and then of course we're not just talking about shower it <laughs> we're talking about purity overall you know in many different ways of our being and our emotions in our eating habits maybe or in whatever you know many things there play a role and so it will depend on that energy whether it feels you are pure enough for that energy to work with because you have to see that if that energy starts working with you then somehow both are connected so if you are quite impure then that energy will suffer from it but that also does not mean that these energies are having such very high expectations of us we are humans no we live in different way you know we digest and what comes out is shit no it's natural so it's also not that they expect us to be absolutely pure and that also in a way with these mahavidyas for example it will depend on which one you choose like kali is very healing energy 
That's the more in interest. So, but if you're interested in healing, then you cannot be very um, cautious when it comes to purity. Because if you're dealing with healing, you're dealing with negative energy, you're dealing with all kinds of problems in the body, which also, you know, create impurity. So, in that way, working with Kali, it will be much more easy to be, let's say, accepted by such an energy than if you work with Kamla. Kamla will have very high expectation. With Kamla, if you are putting there a copper pot, let's say, with water, which we do in these rituals, then every day you'll have to scrub that copper till it shines. It should be totally pure. While with Kali, it doesn't matter very much. No? Just once a month, maybe I put it for a day in vinegar, so that the oxidization it goes, no? and then clean it, and that's fine. So it depends also what kind of energy you are trying to attract. But so then definitely, once they choose you, uh, you have to see that they are in that way also unconditionally choosing you. Before making the choice, sure they will try to find out, you know, who is this and is this worthwhile my effort, because they also have somehow no, not unlimited time, no, not unlimited energy. So they have to feel that through you they can somehow share their energy in a way that both are benefiting from it. But once they make that choice, then, okay, if you, of course, totally lose the sadhana and, and start behaving in a strange way, they might drop you. But they also accept that you are a human being, that you are going through phases, that in some phases you may be more uh, diligent in your sadhana and other phases less. You know? Like I was explaining before we started the class here that now a period in which sadhana is quite difficult has ended, so it is natural. You know? So uh, we can only, when we do this work, try to choose an energy which seems compatible with us. No? And in that way, to choose Kamla, uh, you have to have an idea of yourself of being, yeah, very pure. Uh, so that is one thing, and then, okay, do the sadhana and wait. No? For my main healing energy, I was doing sadhana for more than two years before anything happened. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, is the kind of investment you, you are making. And then, uh, okay, that, that help comes, and then... Uh, you move forward uh, quite fast. No? Things become possible which before were not so possible. So, there's tantric way. It's not needed also, no? let that be clear. It's not needed to do this. No? You can do many, many kinds of yoga without entering this path. No? This is a more mystical path, mysterious path. No? Uh, but it definitely can give you the power for whatever it is you want to do. Because anyhow, whatever you want to do, some power is needed. Even if all you want to reach is enlightenment, then definitely power is needed. And whatever else you want to do, some power is needed. So, okay, you can build power by yourself also. That is actually the best. But to get some energy, to get some power, to get some help is also definitely advisable, but we are free in that, you know? and this is quite a serious kind of pass, no? so I, let's say, also do not expect everybody who feels that they are somehow or other my students, let's say, that they will go on this path, that would be totally ridiculous, this is not actually the idea, no? you can stick to jhana, you can stick to karma yoga, you can stick to bhakti yoga. Anyhow, these are the main things, because they deal with the ego. And then you can do the ashtanga yoga and the meditation, and that deals with the mind. And then you want something more, you feel life is magical, so you want a taste of that, then okay, we can move to tantra.
bhakti, karma and jhana yoga, they are totally complementary because one deals with thinking, the other deals with feeling and the third deals with doing. So these three, anyhow, they are always somehow involved. Try to feel love and connection, try to think truth and try to act in selfless service. These are the three main paths. No? These are not traditions. They may exist as traditions also, but essentially they are paths which everybody somehow has to walk. Sometimes with more emphasis on jhana, sometimes with more emphasis on bhakta. This relates also there to the body type and, uh, you know, tendency to be more involved with thinking, to be more involved with feeling, or to be more involved with acting. You know? And then another one which is essential is Ashtanga in the sense of doing nothing. You know? That is the essential object of Ashtanga is to stop everything. The last stage of Ashtanga is Samadhi, where everything becomes one and is stopped. You know? So that we can find the truth, so that, can, so that we can feel the love, and so that we can act in selfless service without actually having an own agenda. You know? That is what Ashtanga does for us. Through all the Yamas, Niyamas, the sitting, the breathing, the concentrating, the senses, and then the real meditation and the deep meditation. So those are the four essential parts. Then Tantra is optional. Actually Tantra is in a way combining all of that. And that's how it can do things magically. If we are wanting to do magic, then at the same time we have to perform Ashtanga, Karma, Jhana and Bhakti Yoga. Without bhakta, it will not work. Your love, your feeling has to be in it. Without true understanding, it will not work. Without the sense of giving, of sharing, of selfless service, it will not work. And without being able to stop yourself, to be really truly silent inside, to go into deep meditation, it also will not work. So in that way, Tantra Yoga combines these and brings you yeah, something more, you could say, uh, exciting also no? on the yogic path, but at the same time recognized always as a potential ego game, as a potential sidetracking. No? We have to also mistrust these powers because they can make us feel like we are quite something while the whole idea is to come to the point where you feel you are no thing, no? and you are not separate from everybody, and you are joining, you know, cosmic consciousness and, and that whole story. But, you know, the same way as I would not say that if you are a yogi, you are not allowed to go fishing, the same way I cannot say if you are a yogi, you are not allowed to search for some magical powers. It's just a part of life. There is a spiritual world and we can communicate with it and get some help from there. And that is our choice. But it is not a requirement. That must be clear on the yogic path. And it is potentially a trap, <laughs> like everything in life. And, you know, you can say that if somehow you have a power which relates to some energy which is helping you, then this problem may be a little bit less also, because it is not your power. And you know it very well. I know very well in healing what I do. It is not my power. I am just like uh, facilitating it. But there is some other power doing it, and I feel very humbled <laughs> by it. No? So in that way, my ego is not so much in danger of getting very inflated by it. But some powers we can develop, sure, which are really our own as an individual. These are the true yogic powers. You know? The tantric powers are borrowed. The yogic powers, they are your own. So there, the danger of identifying with it, yeah, 
it is there. I think I even said that in last uh, class in the Lila board game. On the last level of seven chakra, the big snake of egotism is there. Why? Because of the CDs. So we should not identify with them. We should always see that these powers we may have, you know, developed in such a way that we are able to use them, but they are never ours. They are divine. They are only a grace, you know, that comes. And uh, so we should not claim them and we should not feel any different than anybody else because we can do something different than other people, you know. This is the same also in more worldly way, you know. If we are very great artists, musicians, speakers, whatever, you know, asana practitioners, there also we have to understand that these are things, okay, which we developed and we can, you know, feel good about that. But uh, these are divine powers that we have developed, no? But we only are channeling it anyway, no? Same as with the more mystical powers like in healing or telepathy or any of the other things that can come, no? In, uh, in yogic practice, no? That is, that is essentially what is there happening the reason why these cities are coming is not because you are aiming for that. In some yogic practices, people will actually aim for it, but it is not needed to aim for it for them to come. They only come because your sense of individuality becomes less. And so you get more connected to these divine powers. You are more empty, so you can be more filled by the Divine. As long as you have so many stories going on and so many things going on, you cannot put anything inside. No? But if you are an empty vessel, then automatically the water, let's say, of Divine Power, it enters you. Like the basic practice of telepathy is depending totally on your ability to silence and empty your mind. I know it, I'm not saying I'm a telepath, but I have my experiences there. If one focuses on a person, while at the same time being empty, it will come. You will know what is in their mind. So, all these powers, whether they are like related to prana, some of these powers are very related to prana, like that. So, there again, it is your, let's say, this identity, identification with your individual ego and your full identification with the life force that makes it possible. So that you become the life force. And once you become the life force, then you can make it do whatever it can do, which is everything. So then, you know, these powers come. It is not personal, so we should never take it personal. Whatever talent we have, we should never take it personal. So if we are good in art, we thank Saraswati, because she is the divine inspiration. She is the muse. She is the one who is inspiring us to do it. If we start taking the credit, and the only thing is about us, soon our art will go down. Anyway, what my teacher Hari Johari always said about those powers is that if they are of use, to humanity, like let's say in healing, then okay, why not? But what's the use of flying? You know, we have airplanes. What's the use of being able to communicate over long distances? We have phones. So in that way, there's also a bit of a difference between these powers. Some are pretty useless, you can say, in normal life. They're mostly used to show off. 
So that especially should be avoided. But if some energy is there, some power is there with which you can help other people, it will also inspire them. No? And it will give them a glimpse of something which is possible, which they thought was not possible. And so it will make their trust, their faith in the past and in the practice more high. So that is also a very good thing.